Thank you for coming this morning. Welcome to the 15th uh, Annual Gopher Symposium. Today we're looking at uh, each of our country of choice this international semester. And we want to welcome our guests this morning to the International Symposium. This is a result of Mr. and Mrs. Harry Vogel, who left a considerable amount of money to Missouri Southern State University to further the international mission and certainly international studies for students. Mr. and Mrs. Gopal, longtime supporters, and Mr. Gopal hired me when I came to this university years ago. He was then chairman of the social science department. So, to get this program started this morning, the first thing I want to do is to introduce Mrs. John Duke and Gina Anthony, known as Cynthia Anthony. Uh, Mrs. Anthony is representing, and she wants to speak to the American University of Cairo, where she is the uh, Director of Applications and certainly, of course, the representative in Washington, D.C. for this major university, the largest university that America has outside of the United States borders. Uh, Mrs. Anthony has a real background as far as international work. For a number of years, she was at the major desk as far as the uh, Department of Commerce in the relationship to Egypt and certainly the commercial, commercial offerings between Egypt and the United States. So our free moments this morning, let's welcome Mrs. Anthony before we move on to her husband who will give a major address. Cynthia? Thank you very much, Dr. Rivera. Father, I appreciate that. And thank you very much uh, for allowing me just to have a couple of minutes to speak about the American University in Cairo. Um, AUC is a, an American university. Um, it was founded in 1919 by Americans. But what I would like to bring to your attention today is the several hundred American students who we have every year studying Arabic, Middle East studies, Egyptian studies, Egyptology, um, at AUC, either for a semester, a year, or a summer session. It's a wonderful place to study Arabic. Um, we are accredited in the United States, so the transfer of credits is, is very, very easy. And I have with me some uh, information and web links and phone numbers of people in our New York office who can give you all the particular sorts of information on the courses and applications and deadlines and costs and that all that sort of thing. Um, but Egypt is, without doubt, one of the most exciting countries in the world, and Cairo is one of the greatest cities in the world. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. I first met John Duke Anthony in the summer of 1987, I believe it was, maybe 88. He was playing softball with a group of high school students, most unlikely thing, for instance, for a CEO of a major, you know, a major service area as far as the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations in Washington, D.C. To come as no surprise, Dr. Anthony loved baseball. One time he was, you know, even scouted by the Pittsburgh Pirates and under a verbal contract with the Philadelphia Phillies as far as his skills were concerned. His PhD from Georgetown University speaks for itself, one of the leading, leading universities in our nation as far as international relations and international studies are concerned. John Duke Anthony, I am certainly beholden to because as he helped make me a fellow with the National Council of U.S. Arab Relations, it's enabled me to travel with him and sometimes with Cynthia and others from the 200 members who are fellows of this institute throughout the Arab world in a various number of countries. He has always been a great representative for the United States. Outspoken, serious, always studious, and he is always well prepared. He has certainly, of course, developed as representing the Arab states, the collective Arab states. And, of course, we have the model Arab League for university students, in which our campus has participated consistently since 1992. This is a great way to learn about the Arab countries, and certainly, of course, our country of choice this year, Egypt. He is, of course, involved with Malone Fellowships for faculty members to study abroad in the Arab nations, and certainly for a Kerr Scholarship for high school and college students. He's been instrumental with the American Arab Institutes in furthering America's commercial interests 
and service interests throughout the Arab world. Hundreds of times he's been in and out of these countries. He speaks Arabic, writes Arabic, and certainly has a lifetime, for instance, given over to this particular part of the world. In fact, take a good look at this man. Even though he's recently had back surgery, he's elected to be with us today in a rather serious back <coughs> surgery. But here's a man, one of the few people you'll ever meet, who has swam from one continent to another. Yeah, one afternoon, he swam across, he and his brother and a couple of friends, the Suez Canal, from Asia to Africa. Now that's no small feat. And remember that as Dr. Anthony addresses us. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Conrad, for that warm and generous welcoming introduction. It's good to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. <clears throat> the uh, only other time I came here was when I was uh, 18 years old <clears throat> and I was a soldier and I wanted to come to the place where Mickey Mantle began his uh, major league uh, career. I actually wasn't in the major leagues here. Uh, he, but he got there soon enough after being here in Joplin. I'm quite impressed by the Mugoku family's uh, legacy. There is the adage that the only thing uh, longer that a person can leave behind <coughs> than their shadow uh, is an institution. Uh, they certainly have done that here. And, but that in itself would only be two-thirds of the truth. Uh, because he's also uh, left an example in being the person that hired uh, Conrad Gubero. And look at the longevity in the life and the miles <coughs> that that legacy has extended and expended here in this uh, part of the United States, uh, passing the baton from one generation of Americans and others from other shores that come here to study uh, so that the world would be better prepared by these educated individuals who pass through these, these halls. Uh, so it's not every university that has such leaders, such unsung heroes and heroines, or such programs and institutions or examples with regard to the kinds of programs and projects and events and activities to which Dr. Gubera mentioned in passing with which he and his fellow faculty, he and his students here, the administration here, he and the alumni here have been involved ever since uh, his presence here going on four decades ago. I've been asked to focus on the country of your choice for this year's emphasis, namely <coughs> Egypt, and you'll have the privilege of hearing uh, Dr. Mark Long uh, subsequently in the two or three days that the two of us are here and we overlap and I'm one of his fans. I've traveled with him to the region as well. So you're in for a treat uh, upon being introduced uh, to and learning uh, from him. But the particular focus that I've been asked to address uh, in this opening session is the changing nature of American interest uh, towards and with Egypt and the implications of those changes uh, for America's national interest and policies, and needs, and concerns, and objectives. The key word in all of this is the word interest. And I know in your political science classes, international studies classes, international relations classes, and even in the heated emotionality of electoral contests for uh, 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 elected commission, uh, positions here, in Joplin and in the larger state and, and nation, you hear this word frequently. It's often used to shut people up in the sense of look in a debate or a reasoned argument or a spirited exchange. We wouldn't do that because it's not in our interest. And it often does have that effect. Or we have no choice but to mobilize and deploy our forces to the region because it's in our national security and related interest. <coughs> And we're all the more impoverished if we do not take this word, this concept uh, of interest and try to unravel it and see indeed what are its components and why does it goad us into action or why does it sometimes uh, make us want to avoid certain kinds of actions. 
I would submit that there are different kinds of interest and in that it is of some interest and value to assign weights to them because not all interests are the same. Uh, some interests we go to war for. Some interests uh, we would do anything but go to war for because of the consequences, the certainty or the anticipated uh, results. I would suggest that in the case of America's relationship with Egypt, as with most other countries, and certainly many of the so-called less developed countries of the world, and their numbers are in the range of 140 out of the 193 members of the United uh, Nations there, uh, that there are some six different categories of interest that we have with Egypt, and by extension with many other countries. And they are in descending order of value. And by using words like value, I'm showing my own biases or my own opinions, my own conclusions after a, uh, an adult lifetime of trying to uh, understand this region and its peoples, its governments, and our relationships uh, with one another. Uh, it's been like an enrollment in a university from which there's no possible graduation. I began in 1963, uh, and I'm still afflicted with nothing more than, on good days, a series of incompletes. Uh, but as I was going to my studies in the region and here to try to specialize in this part of the world, um, this word interest kept coming up, and I thought, well, I'll make that a special project in and of itself. So I will go to people uh, in the nation's capital where I'm privileged to live and work and where I study, met my wife, and spent my career, uh, to ask those who look out for America's national interest, why are we doing what we are doing? And why are we not doing certain other things that, from my logical perspective, seems that we would want to be doing and have long overdue in wanting to be doing? I started doing this in 1968, and I've disciplined myself to do it every four years since then till the, the present. And usually the universe of those I ask this question to are somewhere between 20 and 25. Four, five, or six of them are in the United States Congress, the Senate or the House of Representatives, working on the committees of foreign affairs or intelligence and trade and investment, technology cooperation and the like. Uh, an equal number would be in the Department of State and a slightly smaller number in the Department of Defense and then a sprinkling of those in the uh, Departments of Commerce, Department of Treasury. And if I can find a spooky person who will uh, be willing to meet with me, I try to find one of those as well. And so what I'm sharing with you is their <coughs> answering of this uh, multifaceted question of our interest in Egypt. And it's served me well ever since then to realize that, as I said, not all interests are the same and they need to be discussed, examined, researched, uh, and debated uh, in terms of their, their content. I will list them very quickly in the descending order of their weight and gravity, and then I'll come back and focus on several of them that deserve more attention than what passes for informed thought or established thinking or so-called conventional wisdom would have us Americans and others believe. <clears throat> they are in this order of from one to six, an overarching uh, category of strategic interest, followed by economic interest, followed by political interest, followed by commercial interest, followed by defense cooperation interest. And you're forgiven if you're uh, saying, when the hell is he going to get around to talking about democracy? and uh, human rights, and civil rights, and civil society, and non-governmental organizations, and the like. They happen to be in the sixth category. Now, this is bad news for many who would have them be in the first category. But I'm trying to be as honest and frank and forthright uh, as I can, and you deserve nothing less than that. Coming back to the sixth of them now, the strategic ones are oftentimes so obvious that we forget about them, <clears throat> like the nose on our face. Uh, there we uh, know it's there, and we go on about other things than worrying about the nose on our face. But these strategic ones have at least the following half dozen components. 
Many of them are grouped around trying to avoid war, or prevent war, or end war. And the other side of the coin is to prolong peace and tranquility and uh, a setting where people can plan efficiently, can plan effectively, uh, can anticipate, uh, can predict. They're not caught off guard. None of us want to be in a situation where we cannot plan and anticipate and predict and, and have a productive, effective, meaningful, fulfilling, and successful life, if, 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 we, if, if at all possible. So the wars and pieces uh, that have afflicted this region and characterized this region are higher than anything else that I might have to offer. And that is as obvious as can be, but there are particular things that have happened uh, that have brought about the wars that have occurred and have prolonged the pieces uh, that have also occurred. In this particular region, it's the one part of the planet that we Americans, along with our friends, along with our partners, along with our allies, along with the willing, along with the billing, uh, have uh, agreed to mobilize and deploy with us and to send more troops uh, to this part of the planet than any other place in the world in the last quarter of a century. Have killed more people than any other place in the world over the last uh, quarter of a century. Have spent more taxpayers' dollars uh, in the last quarter of a century than we have spent in any other corner of the planet than uh, the United States itself. Uh, having, uh, in this regard, obviously not gotten matters straight or not understood it uh, well enough, or our knowledge being imperfect, or our skills being something less than fully uh, competent and, and requisite uh, to the, the needs. What has brought these about? Four of them have been Arab-Israeli conflicts, wars between uh, that Egypt has uh, taken part in all of the major Arab-Israeli wars with the exception of the <laughs> summer of 2006 when the Israelis yet again invaded uh, Lebanon or in the end of 2008 and into 2009 right up until two days before the inaugural uh, address of uh, President, newly elected President uh, Barack Obama, the Israeli invasion into, into Gaza. So Egypt has been front and center of all of these. Now what has brought about some of these wars in addition to or in, in relationship to the Arab-Israeli conflict have been the following, the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal has been shut twice uh, since its uh, opening in 1869. The first time was with the Israeli plus the French and the British. Three countries invaded Egypt in the autumn of 1956. When they say timing can make or break a success or failure in politics, uh, the three of them chose the week of America's national elections in the autumn of 1956 when Eisenhower was running for his uh, second term of office. That same week, by the way, the same uh, uh, constellation of days was when the Soviet Union rolled its tanks into downtown Budapest to crush an uprising uh, in uh, Central uh, Europe. So the Suez Canal has figured in this twice. That closure was for less than one year, but it clobbered the French economy and to a significant extent the British economy as well. The second time uh, was in June 1967, again with the uh, last of the Egyptian-Israeli wars where the canal stayed shut for eight years. And what this did to international commerce and traffic and maritime and naval uh, uh, goods and trades and mobilization and dispatching of forces from west to east and east to west uh, it, it is self-evident in terms of Egypt being at the fulcrum of that. Of course, during the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, uh, August the 2nd, 1990, ultimately some 732 oil wells were set afire. And this uh, was a big catalyst uh, for the mobilization and the deployment of the United States, along with Egypt. Most Americans are not aware that Egypt ships ch fought alongside Americans and the soldiers and air women and men of 33 other nations to reverse Iraq's aggression and to restore national sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity uh, to Kuwait. So you have a, a feeling uh, here of what uh, constitutes a strategic interest in how Egypt has played into them. 
On the economic side, it's less and more than one might imagine. It's certainly less than that of the energy-rich oil-producing countries of Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, <coughs> Saudi, Saudi Arabia, <coughs> and Libya as well, uh, on top of which we also have Syria to a degree, and uh, Iraq as well as Algeria. Uh, but we come back again to the canal through which so much of the world's international commerce and trade and what that has to do with uh, countries' gross national products and people's revenue and government's uh, income and people's per capita income by which uh, they live the material aspect of their lives. Egypt is also central in, the, in these uh, uh, aspects of America's uh, interests. It has become, since the Camp David Accords of 1979, the peace treaty between Egypt and uh, Israel, uh, the largest of America's overseas economic assistance and development programs and projects. Uh, up until the last few years where it has rapidly been replaced by Iraq, where we have the uh, largest embassy of the United States anywhere in the world. Uh, but Egypt remains number two in that regard. And because of the extensive uh, American uh, economic assistance, uh, to Egypt, uh, though less so than it was in the beginning of the Camp David Accord, but especially also in the defense area, in terms of advanced uh, defense structures, defense uh, assistance, def uh, defense systems, uh, education and military spare parts, and, and training and maneuvers and agreements, uh, that economic aspect uh, has a defense component to it, which with Egypt is much stronger and more prominent than most Americans are aware. Indeed, for more years than we have not, we have held annually, or biannually rather, something called the Bright Star Exercises, where American armed forces, men and women and personnel have exercised in Egypt under various contingencies and scenarios in wargaming and, and simulation uh, for uh, hopefully there not being a need for another uh, mobilization and deployment comparable to the three that have taken in the last quarter of a century there uh, thus far. Now the benefits of that uh, I've yet to read in any of um, America's uh, mainstream media in the sense that uh, Egyptian armed forces, armed personnel have trained with thousands of American armed forces and trained personnel. And the cumulative benefits uh, of, and rewards of those 30 years of an usness between American uh, defense personnel and Egyptian defense personnel have largely been on parade for the last nine months. As you, as you have seen a degree of military restraint in response to the demonstrations and protests in Cairo uh, that no one would have predicted uh, prior to that aspect of our relationship occurring. The third descending order category of interest uh, has to do with a set of political interests. And here one needs to be very careful of focusing on the foreign policy aspects of the political interest, not the domestic uh, uh, dynamics of it. If you're listening to or respecting and appreciating an Egyptian perspective, here we're talking about the golden rule of do not do unto others that which you would not have others do unto you. And it is a given that Americans would not countenance Egyptians having a full court press uh, play inside of the United States to try to woo or win over Americans to Egyptian principles or ethical uh, concepts and, and, and values. Uh, but the other side of the coin is where the rub is, in the sense that the United States has had a tendency, a proclivity, for more than half a century to interfere in the domestic affairs of other uh, uh, people's uh, business. And Egypt would be a case in point there. Uh, right at the present and in the past, and likely to continue for some time yet to come. And that is a source of major tension uh, between the two of us. But on the foreign policy aspect, it, it has been because Egypt has the Arab world's long, largest army, the most battle-tested, the most experienced, uh, engage, engagement in war uh, with uh, Israel and its relationship with the American aerospace and defense sector and the understandings and the undertakings and the agreements and the arms purchases uh, that I've alluded to 
make the political aspect uh, as problematic as any that we have. On the commercial side, less than one might think. And this is where, indeed, America's interests have changed over the last uh, several decades. It used to be, when I first went to Washington, thinking I would like to have a career in foreign service or international affairs, it used to be that commerce and uh, economics were all wrapped in together, having to do with trade and banking and investment uh, and patents and copyrights and trademarks and things of that nature. That's no longer the case. It's not been the case since the middle 1970s. In the mid-1970s, when you had the last Arab oil embargo, uh, these two functions were separated in terms of different categories of interest. So the American economic interest since then has been simple and straightforward, sheer access to the region's resources. And particularly, it's hydrocarbon fuels, it's oil and gas resources, upon which all economies in the world run, rich and poor, old and new, uh, and small and, and, and newly uh, emerging. And so it's not just uh, the industrialized economies of the West or the, the United States. So th this aspect of commerce being taken out, why? In order to lower the oil import bill, the gas import bill, it is in our national interest to export as much as we can of value in terms of goods and services in order to lower that humongous uh, energy uh, import uh, bill. So that is why commerce was separated out and comes right after the political ones as number four. The fifth one is the defense cooperation. Now that, in many people's minds, uh, is number one. Indeed, uh, when I began this research, it was number one in my mind except the real policy makers disabused me of that notion. I'm either old enough or young enough to remember a labor leader by the name of George Meany. And he was the head of the AFFL-CIO, the largest of America's consolidated trade union movements. And the rank and file would oftentimes criticize his leadership by saying, Mr. Meany, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You've never been on strike a day in your life. And he said, that's right, and I'm proud of it. And you should hope that you'd never have to go on strike either. That's our only weapon. Once that weapon is unsheathed, we're weaker than before we unsheathed it. And so I'm a former soldier myself and still consult for our Department of Defense since 1974, straight through till now. Most of the officers, overwhelming majority, of the officers and the enlisted folks with whom I have worked and trained and dealt with. I do not want to go to war. Uh, they are the exceptions uh, who want to get the ribbons and want to get the promotions because they've been tried and tested in combat. But they are the exceptions. Like our teachers here and elsewhere have taught us, look out for the exceptions and the aberrations because that's exactly what they are, the exceptions and aberrations. We're trying here to come up with generally valid propositions that withstand sunlight and, and honest invest, invest, uh, investigation. So the defense cooperation has usually entailed access to other people's military facilities, weights and specifications being of the same uh, denomination. It has been easier, far easier, indescribably easier for us to mobilize and deploy and, and fight effectively in Arabia and the Gulf because the British left the weights and the measures and the standards and the specifications into which we could plug in. It would not have been nearly as easy had we tried to do something like that in that Arab North Africa, where the overlay of the French and the British, and to a lesser degree the Italians, has had that particular impact. Now we come down to the sixth one, and that does have to do with the big, the little D word in terms of democracy and human rights and civil rights and gender rights and civil society and uh, the ongoing perpetuation of the English language, which makes things uh, infinitely easier for us on a transactional basis. But you have Egypt here at the forefront, at the tip of the spear in various ways, but not always here. Ponder the following, that one out of three of all Arabs on earth is an Egyptian. 
There are 22 Arab countries, 28 Middle Eastern countries, 57 Islamic countries, but that one out of three of all Arabs is an Egyptian is then a reality, a stubborn fact of reality that has its own uh, implications. Uh, not surprisingly, those large numbers have produced extraordinary intellects over the years in arts and letters. Naguib Mahfouz, having won the uh, Nobel Prize for, for Literature, and the bulk of whose books have been published by American University in Cairo, uh, Press in Cairo. Well, the great Egyptian woman singer, Um Kathum. Uh, when I first uh, went to Egypt in 1963, I got to listen to this extraordinary woman who was a taskmaster. Uh, a friend of mine was a, a drummer, one of many drummers in her backup orchestra. And he said that she made them practice five days a week, six hours on those five days a week for the concert that she would give regularly year round on usually on Friday or, th or, th or Thursday nights uh, throughout uh, Egypt and listened to throughout the Arab world. In terms of international law with regard to your studies here in political science and your study abroad programs here, the largest vote getter in the last three years to the International Law Commission, which codifies, tries to codify international law for coming generations, was an Egyptian. His name is Hussein Hassouna who happens to also be a holder of a PhD, former ambassador to Morocco and to Yugoslavia, as well as the League of Arab States ambassador to the United States. And it is the League of Arab States to which uh, Conrad uh, Guevara made reference uh, regarding uh, your university's 19 consecutive years of participating in this project, where young people, 17 through 23, 24, roughly in that age range, who are, who are nervous, who are ill at ease behind a microphone, who never want to be called upon to speak in front of the class, or who would beg Ms. <coughs> Jones, don't make me give that report. I'll do anything, stay after school, mow your lawn, but please don't make me speak in front of my classmates. Within uh, two days, you can have that 17, 18 year old boy or girl, young woman, young man, uh, full of confidence, dancing out there at the end of the rainbow there of realizing how to string together nouns and verbs with conviction, with compassion, with, uh, with commitment, in competition uh, with others. That particular program uh, instills discipline, instills organization, it shows people and it gives them direct first-hand experience in, to how to run a meeting and how to disagree with others admirably and, and, and with dignity and how to learn to win w with charity and, and dignity and lose with charity and dignity, realizing that another day, another chance uh, may, may come to pass. So these are the six categories of America's interest in Egypt. And they are conflicted in terms of most of the first five with the sixth one. And the sixth one is the one that is a result of who and what we are as a people in terms of our own ideas, our own ideals, and what it is that from our forebearers, our foremothers and forefathers, we cherish and hold dear and are willing to die for and to go to war in order to preserve. Uh, we have these uppermost uh, in our mind, but they don't happen by accident or by coincidence. We're talking about a particular part of the world that wears itself also on people's emotions. Here, for example, is the place where, in terms of human recorded uh, history, <coughs> where the first uh, child cried, uh, the first people died, one I liked rather much, the first love aside uh, there, and in terms of it also being geographically, the intersection of three uh, continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and uh, Dr. Guevara surprised me by making reference that yes, uh, I was able to swim from one to, to another uh, there back in 1963. This is also the anvil of antiquity, the source of sunshine on the classical world, and given uh, the birthplace of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the culture of civilization, the cradle of, uh, of culture as we in, in, the, in the West know it, making the region on some days seeming to be the traffic jam of the devout in terms of being the epicenter of prayer and pilgrimage, of faith and spiritual devotion uh, for fully half of humanity. I was asked to speak for 20 minutes. That's 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Again, let me thank you for coming this morning, and we'll open the round of questions. If you have a question, please come down to the microphone and certainly address it so that we can hear it better. And the rest of the community here, as far as uh, you know, our gathering here, can also hear. I'll start out by asking, of course, uh, the first question to Dr. Anthony, and uh, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, this, this past four months, we in Joplin, Missouri, have had other things occupying our mind, certainly our attention. And, you know, we have, have worked hard to overcome what the disaster nature brought to us as far as last May is concerned. Given that, Dr. Anthony, that we're a local community in the Mad West, the very edge of southwest Missouri, bordering Oklahoma Territory, um, why? Why do people in Joplin really care about Egypt? It's certainly what's happening in Egypt as far as right now, contemporary time, regarding the elections and, and the new government and, and whether Egypt will become democratic or not. Well, it's a good question and a timely one. It could hardly be more relevant. The answer to your question would take uh, various uh, components, but uh, I'm proceeding with an assumption here that most in the audience, from before they were six years old, they knew that there was a place called Egypt in the world. 212 countries in the world, 193 of the United Nations. Uh, it says something rather of staggering profundity that perhaps the first country other than their own that uh, most Americans, and I would think that that's true through much of the Western world in general, came to learn was, was Egypt. And certainly in my case, it was, even if it was only limited to them mummies, them tombs. That, that's a phrase out of Catcher in the Rye, a dialogue between Holden Caulfield and his buddy. You know about Egypt, don't you? Yeah. What do you know about Egypt? Them mummies, them tombs. <laughs> so we knew about them mummies and them tombs, but we knew about the Sphinx and the Nile and the pyramids, and that perhaps was about it. Uh, but uh, being um, in the West, and most in the West are from the three Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, Egypt has been part and parcel. The uh, land at the hip uh, of all three of these faiths. Uh, from the beginning until the present. And um, there is a Christian minority in Egypt, the Coptic community, some 10%. And they struggle as a minority, as minorities the world over struggle for their rights and security and a life of peace and prosperity, if at all possible, uh, when they are not in the majority, not fully calling the shots. So for Americans looking to see uh, how Muslims and Christians uh, in the larger number of Arab countries, the Middle East and the Islamic world, are going to work out yet uh, another modus operandi or way to live together, coexist together, and be part of an usness together as opposed to we and they or those and them. And much rides on the answer to your question as e Egyptians are focused towards having a new constitution uh, with uh, a new Bill of Rights and a new uh, rule book or playbook by which all the citizens of, of Egypt would be expected to abide by and to derive the benefits from as well as shoulder the responsibilities for. Now, so far the, the level of bloodshed has been surprisingly minimal compared to what one would have had reason to believe uh, beforehand. So that has been encouraging. Will it remain? Uh, no one can answer that from here. Uh, secondly, what if uh, an extremist or uh, militant faction uh, were to come to power or to sway? Uh, would that mean the end of the world? What would be the American response when the first new <coughs> Egyptian Minister of Justice who studied the Sharia and knows it inside, outwards, backwards, and forward, were to show up on a <coughs> formal visit to the United States. Would the uh, Attorney General of the United States be as comfortable or try to find a way to wiggle out having to receive uh, her or him 
at Dulles International Airport or JFK International uh, Airport here. Uh, what does it have to do with uh, freedom of expression? What does it have to do with uh, pluralism of political party uh, systems? There are some, there are more than four dozen uh, political parties that have uh, registered to run for the elections coming up in the next few months. The, the elections will be staggered. The first ones will be starting next month and going till January uh, the 20th, I believe, uh, for the lower house. And they will be staggered. And you might ask, well, why don't they have them all on the same day? There's a reason for staggering the elections that's coming into the region that is uh, interesting to behold and, and study. And then after that will be additional elections for the upper house, uh, for the uh, Senate. And then after those two elections, there will be a commission that has six months to come up with this new constitution. No doubt, uh, Conrad, we will be uh, studying it word by word, line by line, in terms of is this progressive, is this liberal, is this more modernizing, is this freedom and, and franchising, or is it curtailing, is it backpedaling? Um, I have a feeling it will be the form, uh, far more so than the latter, but that again, remains to be seen. And also because Egypt has been a leader in the Arab world, more than it has not for most of the last century, uh, all of the other Arab countries will understandably be looking at what Egypt does and what it does not, for cues, for lessons, for examples that perhaps they wish to avoid or perhaps uh, wish to emulate. It's at least all of those things, kind of, uh, if not many, many more in addition to those. Well, that's a lot of an answer. <laughs> Great question. Questions? <laughs> questions? Someone must surely have a question. Okay. Earl, can you say it loud enough? I know you've got a little bit of confidence. I'll repeat it for you. Southern California. 
Uh, in fact, the world's first skyscrapers came out of Yemen, and I've been to them a number of times. 10, 12, 13 stories, not a piece of metal in, in any of the floors, it's still functioning as they were 600 years ago. Um, people have a big space in their heart for the Yemenis because they are so renowned as hard workers and creators. They've been the hewers of wood and the bearers of water since time immemorial. Um, and they are the renowned Arab world's best ports on top of everything else. Uh, but given the description I gave you, which is not totally unlike an Arab Tibet or Nepal uh, there in terms of infrastructure, it's easier, it's easier than elsewhere for people with uh, malevolent intentions uh, to hide and gain asylum or to blend in there than most other places. So uh, this is why Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has found a, a, an anchor there. But it's not massive. I mean, even Leon Panetta, I will say we're talking only about dozens. And the dozens would be the people in these first three rows here. Uh, that have uh, the world transfixed about trying to uh, get a corner on that element. It will be elusive, sir, for the reasons I've given you, uh, that are man-made and nature-made. It will be elusive also because of our domestic politics here. Most of our aid, which is paltry and pithy, uh, that goes to Yemen is for counter-terrorism assistance trying to track down these two dozen individuals uh, when the country is massively in need of everything imaginable, especially institutions in education and basic health. And neither of those can go forward without security and stability. So they all wrap together, but uh, there's no magic wand to be waved. Uh, the good news is that all of Yemen's neighbors uh, are fully behind doing whatever is necessary that is also possible and feasible uh, to make progress in Yemen. That was not the case in 1994. In 1994, the country had a civil war from April to July, and all of their neighbors sided with the secessionists. This time around, it's completely the opposite. But money pledged, money promised, like your alumni appeals here and elsewhere, a promise is one thing, a pledge is another. And the old phrase, it's in the mail, uh, really doesn't uh, effectively pay for the scholarship that people uh, ask for pledges to be made. And so uh, there are these aspects of delivering the assistance promised that have been elusive and will likely remain so. And we're part of that too, because since 9-11, we, more than any other country in the world, working especially with Saudi Arabia. No countries work closer with us than Saudi Arabia to try to uh, tamp down on money laundering or so-called terrorist financing. As we speak here, we have people in, we Americans have people in Saudi Arabia, elbow to elbow with Saudi Arabians, around the clock, eight days a week, uh, looking for clues for money laundering and illicit uh, financing uh, going to people whose motives are something other than what they profess them to be. So we help to skew many of these uh, problems. The, the money that we provide for women on an annual basis would be something like about what we provide uh, Israel every 12 days. Uh, we provide Yemen in 365 days, that which we provide Israel in 12 days. So the asymmetry, the imbalance, the perceived gross inequity and unfairness could hardly be more self-evident. Mr. Goddard, that was an interesting question, considering that um, I know you're a student of the Bible, that the Yemenite that was uh, their ancient Shiva, used to be the queen of Shiva, was in Yemen. And Yemen was the only country that was split by the communists back in the days of the Cold War, where part of it was actually a communist state funded out of Moscow. It didn't ever work very well in the Arab world. But across the Red Sea, Egypt took notice and observed this. Is that the Prophet Hood is buried, his burial place is in Yemen, in the Hadramaut. I've been, been to it. It's the only one in the uh, Holy Quran that is uh, mentioned where it's all right for Muslims to go to 
a shrine other than that. If any of them, that's the only one on the planet. And all due respect, thanks to Dr. Anthony, a number of scholars and students from the United States have been to Yemen in and out as far as his programs are concerned. You know something about this really remarkable country that, you know, you have to be there on the ground to see it because, as he said, Yemen captures the heart doesn't give it back. And certainly, uh, thanks to John, I know that there have been dozens of professors and university students who have been in and out of Yemen through your program. Uh, National Council on U.S. Arab Relations. Other questions? Please. Dr. Tannenbaum. Oh, sorry. First, let me thank you for, let me thank you for your very insightful comments. You've given us a great deal to think about. And it's been a very rich presentation. Uh, if I might, I'd like to get a two for all my questions. Uh, my first question is about the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations. Um, does your organization um, engage lobbying activities on behalf of foreign countries? No. Thank you. And uh, if you might, could you tell us uh, briefly about uh, the Council's leading financial support for some sponsors? Yes. And, and let me ask my second question, then you can all take my seat. Sure. Um, my second question relates to the substance of what you're speaking about. Um, is it reasonable to expect Egypt uh, to develop a Western style liberal democracy? Uh, or would it make more sense to expect Egypt to take a more uniquely Egyptian or perhaps Islamic world to democracy? Yes, um, as to the second part of your first question, uh, we have uh, more than 60 um, uh, corporate supporters. Uh, they are what you would call Fortune 100 companies. They have one or two uh, annual reviews of the booklets that I brought with me, they all listed there. Uh, using the language of the old Watergate, Nixon era, uh, these are all the unindicted co-conspirators. In other words, they're, they're banks, they're construction companies, they're energy companies, they're aerospace and defense companies, they're law firms, they're all, all of these. Um, on top of that, uh, more than a, a thousand individuals like Dr. Gubera, who alumni of our programs, a form of participants in them. We have an annual appeal, uh, as the university here does, so we're the beneficiary of that. We've never taken any money from the United States government uh, because of the strings that come with it and the, uh, the rather arduous uh, uh, reporting uh, requirements on the lobbying thing. We could lobby, and there are many people that say, why don't you lobby? Because we could. And the law says that you, we could lobby up to one-fifth of that personnel doing nothing but that. One-fifth of the human hours in a week uh, within the office that are devoted to that. And or one-fifth of our budget could go for that. We don't do any of it. We've never done it from the beginning. And we're not, not inclined to do so. Um, on the Egyptian um, political re-engineering uh, experiment, uh, might it have a liberal dose of Western democratic values and ideals and principles infused in it, or might it have a more local variant, including uh, an Islamic variant? Uh, the, uh, one can say the answer is yes, it's both, uh, in the sense, and, and it's not a zero sum game, it's not mutually exclusive, but you can have some of each, uh, just as our uh, country's founding documents in the philosophers. Uh, who left a lasting imprint. Uh, they did not come from Joplin or, or from Springfield uh, alone. Uh, I mean, they came from all over. So likewise, Egypt's um, have in the past come from hither and yon and are almost bound in second to do so uh, uh, yet again. Uh, there are some aspects on the Islamic side that are bothersome to uh, Westerners. Uh, without necessarily conducting the diligent research. Uh, but one in terms of the inheritance, the law of personal status and inheritance. Uh, Muslim women in law have had far more liberal, gen generous and beneficial rights and privileges uh, than Western women anywhere have yet to acquire in terms of what they are uh, able by law 
to claim and inherit from their deceased uh, parents. Uh, we've got a long ways to go before we can uh, get to uh, be, uh, that's just one e example. Um, there are many uh, examples that people uh, do not um, find attractive in Islamic law, just as in Western law, there are many things that people who are Confucians, who are Buddhists, who are Hindus, who are Sikhs, who are Taoists, who are Jains, and animists don't find um, uh, appealing uh, by their lights and by their standards of what, of what is, is appropriate. Uh, we all, in a way, live in a leaky boat. Uh, none of us live in an extension of Nibbana. Uh, who amongst us is bereft of blemish? Raise your hand if you're devoid of defect or free of flaw. So uh, they will likely uh, draw from uh, whatever sources they find uh, deserve serious and favorable consideration as possibly helping to improve something. Time for one more question. Please. How is the United States government financing the Egyptian government after the revolution? I don't know. My wife may want to weigh in on this. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, there are monies that, in our budgetary process, that the three A's, not alcohol, like uh, anonymous from Alabama, uh, and allocations, uh, authorizations, and appropriations. And so allocations is the first in the budgetary cycle. And then next, uh, we'll be hearing some committee uh, investigations and testimonies. And then you will get uh, authorizations that, in other words, if we have the money, yes, we, we, we will authorize that. But the hardest is the last one, and that's appropriations. And that's actually to, to find the money dedicated and put it aside. It is fully dedicated to this, that, and the other specified purpose. So the allocated monies would still be there from before, because it's been, what, nine months. Uh, a number of the authorized monies would be as well. Uh, appropriated monies that were not appropriated would, I uh, think, speaking out loud here, uh, winging, so to speak, uh, would be on hold. You find the bureaucratic response of saying, well, Let's wait until the elections. They're coming up just three weeks from now. Let's wait and see what those results are. And, uh, and if there's something untoward in them, or charges of mass corruption, well, then we have every reason to, to sit on that money. Uh, if, um, if it's applauded as free and fair, or open and transparent, uh, the, uh, the authorities are now disagreeing. The uh, Council of the Armed Forces, they are the government de facto and quasi de jure of what is running Egypt now and making the decisions. Um, Cynthia, you want to add to that or detract from that? Um, no, the... just, just turn and face them, I think they make the um, what, what John just said is correct. Uh, my understanding is the, the military aid, which is around 1.3 billion, so that's the huge bulk of the U.S. assistance to Egypt. Um, that, my understanding is, um, continues pretty much as it was. Those uh, relationships that, that John Bradley was talking about before the training exercises, Bright Star, and the relationships between our military and the Egyptian military continue. Um, the economic assistance used to be just over $800 million. It's now down to $200 million. So it's prepped way down in the last five or six years. A lot of that money is programmed money, and it goes towards uh, assistance to non-governmental organizations, NGOs, uh, many of which do uh, democratization governance work, although that's a very, very sensitive area, as you might well imagine. Uh, the appropriations that John was referring to in Congress is very, Again, a very politically sensitive issue. There is a move in the U.S. Congress among some to, to try to decrease, uh, because of the U.S. zone budgetary 
difficulties, hard assistance uh, in general. So that's that's an ongoing chapter. But there's there's really no the State Department and USAID, US Agency for International Development, face a, a conundrum really. Um, there are these incredible changes that have happened in the Arab world, and there's really no more money to do anything with. We're, we're operating on um, still for another few days, uh, fiscal year 2011 appropriations from Congress on October 1st, we changed to fiscal year 2012. And that appropriations, foreign operations appropriations bill hasn't even been done yet for FY12. Um, so it's, it's really um, quite a great challenge and the um, State Department has been trying to move some money around and um, you know there are other countries for instance, Tunisia, where the economic program is very small, there is an effort to try to provide some assistance there. And the money for that had to be taken out of the money for another part of the world. So um, there really isn't a, a great, huge amount of either amount of resources or change of resources not really been taking place since the end of January. <coughs> Well, let me uh, thank you again for coming this morning, for the nature of your questions. I want you to think about possibly returning tonight for the full program, mentioning this to others. Uh, there's still much yet to be discussed. And so proud to bring Dr. Anthony and bring into this campus. And let us give him a round of applause.